Be in the moment. Be in the moment, right? Yeah, that's the only way to survive it. We got a good crowd here. Yeah, we do. <laughs> all right, we're going to get going here. Thank you guys all for being here. Uh, just before we get going, uh, we have so much pizza. So please eat more. Um, it's all over there. Have at it. It's all free. Um, yeah, go for it. But yeah, here we are. Thank you guys so much for being here on our panel on navigating the workforce, identity issues. I practiced that so many times in my head, and I botched it. Uh, we're off to a great start. No, but seriously, thank you guys for being here. Um, we have a really great panel, um, and I'm all really, we're all excited to, to offer you our life experiences and what, what advice we can, we can give. Uh, so you guys aren't here to listen to me talk. Uh, let's introduce our panel. If you want to go down the line and give us your name, your pronouns, all that good stuff, and we'll get going. Hi, I'm Casey. Uh, my pronoun, pronouns are she, they. Uh, I'm a digital content producer at ABC 15. Um, and I fairly recently graduated from Cronkite in December, so fairly new to the workforce. <laughs> Hi, my name is April Reed. My pronouns are she, her. I'm the vice president of advocacy at Ability360. That's a local nonprofit that works with people with disabilities. Um, I graduated from ESU many years ago, got my master's here um, from the School of Social Work, um, and I identify as a person with a physical disability. Hi, everybody. Remember, free pizza, pizza free. Don't leave free food. Um, <clears throat> I, my name is Diana Nanez, or Diana Nanez, depending on if you speak Spanish. Um, uh, my pronouns are she, they. I am an executive editor and co-founder of a nonprofit newsroom called Arizona Luminaria. Um, we focus on coverage that is uh, more equitable and ethical for our communities, and that's very people-centered. Hey everyone, my name is Shamar Woods. I'm a professor of practice here at Cronkite, working in the Sports Bureau. Good to see some uh, students here in attendance. I'm also the editorial director at Sports Illustrated as well. I graduated from Hampton University in Hampton, Virginia, uh, which is an HBCU. Cool. Uh, Shamar, I think you're the only one who didn't graduate from, from ASU. On this yeah, panel. it might be, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Please don't before. kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> and before we get too far, um, my name is Danielle Cortez. I'm a photographer for Major League Baseball. I'm one of the D-backs team photographers. I freelance. I am a contributor to PHNX. I have so many jobs. Um, and I also teach here. I teach sports photojournalism, JMC 352. It's a fun class if you want to take it. Um, <laughs> And yeah, I also happen to be a member of the transgender community. I came out in 2020. Yeah, March of 2020, I came out publicly. And I haven't looked back since. So uh, if you guys want to know more about me, there was a story written about me in The Athletic. Uh, PHNX did a piece on me. Uh, you don't have to hear me talk about it. Uh, so let's get going. Uh, Casey, if you want to just tell us a little bit about your journey and who you are. Uh, yeah, go for it. Sure. Um, so I sort of recently came into realization that I'm non-binary, um, sort of in 2021, um, and that I wasn't like publicly out until fall of 2021. Um, and so a lot of my time in my final semester was just sort of figuring out how to integrate that into my day-to-day -day life, my professional life. Um, and Julia Thompson has been a great contributor to that. <laughs> um, and so since then, um, as I've been working at ABC 15, um, sort of just finding my place in there as 
one of the, if not the youngest person in the newsroom, so sort of finding my grinding, my grounding there, um, while also trying to uh, sort of stand my ground with my gender identity because I am more uh, feminine presenting, so I feel like people usually just default to the, the she, her part of she, they. Um, but I have found a couple people in my newsroom that you know they uh, will use they, them pronouns for me um, and sort of check in to make sure that everything's been going smoothly and whatnot. Um, and also just trying to, to help other people in the newsroom uh, talk specifically about like LGBTQ issues. Um, there was, we talked about it a little bit in our virtual meeting, um, about whenever the Arizona, Arizona passed bills on uh, transgender children in sports. Um, and so like that was really eye-opening to see like just how much people didn't know how to talk about transgender issues. Um, specifically, like I don't think hardly anyone had under like or heard the term uh, cisgendered, um, and so there was a lot of work done to try to you know educate the reporters, make sure that they were saying the right things, as well as whenever everything was going up online, that all of their web copy was uh, using the proper term terminology. Um, so. That's been my journey so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's funny you mentioned the uh, the, the anti-transports bill. Uh, I actually testified in in, uh, in the committee uh, against that bill. Um, so something that hits very close to home for for me there. Uh, April. Um. So uh, I uh, have had a disability my whole life. I have something similar to Parkinson's disease. Um, and it is a progressive disability. So many years I have used a wheelchair. Um, I, I wasn't able to walk. Basically what happens without um, proper advances in treatment that I now have, you basically aren't able to move your muscles in the way that others could. And so when I was actually here at ASU, I was using a wheelchair full time. And right before I graduated, there were some advancements in medication and I started that process of learning to walk again. And so going through that process, I was also looking for work. And I had done an inter internship um, at Ability360. And my professor here had said, you know, why aren't, why aren't you thinking about working with people with disabilities? You have that experience and, and that could enhance your professional work. And I thought, okay, I'll try it. So I did an internship there. And I really found, um, you know, in social work, our philosophy is to, to help people find self-determination and what matters to them. And that was the same philosophy at Ability360. We're there to support people on whatever their goal is. We're not there to tell them what that should be. And so we pour, support them in speaking up and learning how to, to self-determine um, in their lives. And so that was a really good fit for me uh, as a professional social worker, but also as, as what I believed um, it should be possible for people with disabilities and that you know the view of disability should be people with disabilities can do anything anybody else can it just might look a little bit different and that's okay and so my job isn't to tell people what to do or what to care about it's to listen to them and and help them figure out what matters to them and and support them in setting those goals and reaching those goals so after my internship I ended up working at Ability360 and like I said earlier, you know, I was kind of on my own journey of, of being somebody who had a very obvious physical disability. We all look for the wheelchair or the service animal and we think, okay, I understand that's a person with a disability. But what people are surprised about is actually most people with disabilities have an invisible or an unseen disability. And so I was kind of making that transition to being a person where unless you're around me for a little bit, you probably don't notice the tremors, you probably um, don't notice little jerks or movements. You can't see fatigue or pain, right? So um, most of, of people with disabilities fall into that category. You don't see depression, you don't see anxiety, you don't see low vision. Um, you might not see um, the chronic pain. And so that's always surprising to people that most people with disabilities are in that category. 
And so for me, that was a real journey. Not only was I working now for the first time, but now I was learning how to talk about my disability in a different way. I had to learn how to explain it to people and how to talk about what accommodations or what supports I needed, or even just learn what part of my story I was willing to share with people. Um, and so that's exactly what I do in my job as well. And so I started off at Ability360 um, doing more like case management, and over the course of time, um, I was able to step into our role as uh, the VP of advocacy. And so for the last five years, I've been the designated lobbyist at Ability360, and I help our agency craft a lot of our educational messages to the community, talking about policy and funding and, and services for people with disabilities, not only to engage people with disabilities to take action, but to engage allies to care and understand about the issues and take action. And I also work a lot with our marketing department on the visuals that we create, the stories that we tell. Um, for 12 years, I coordinated our peer mentor program, which is people with all different types of disabilities volunteering their time as mentors. So they're telling their stories to help other people and coach and encourage other people. And that's what we try to do in our storytelling. So we work a lot to tell honest, authentic stories about people with disabilities. We don't want to create stereotypes about um, some of those old images of people with disabilities that were sick or we don't work or we um, even some of the images that are outdated, you know, that um, we'll see a lot of pictures where somebody's helping a person with a disability instead of that person being shown active and moving and, and working. And so um, those messages and, and those images are really important to us as an agency because we know that changes the way people think about disabilities and the way they think about how we contribute. Um, so that, even though I'm a social worker, you know, I've learned so much about what you do and how that messaging is all about self-advocacy and about change and social justice. Oh, thank, thank you so much for, for sharing your journey. I know it's, it's not always easy. Uh, Diana, tell us a little bit about yourself. Yes, thank you so much for both your stories. Um, I hope you all heard pieces of that idea of helping others share their stories. That's the core of what we do as journalists, right? Um, but it's also something I think in our community as journalists, we have to think about how we help each other right here today in this space, share our own stories, um, feel supported to support the idea that you all have your own stories and your own identities too. And that makes journalism better, right? Um, and if you start supporting each other now, and you create a community now. I joke sometimes like your nights of round table. Um, you'll carry that with you throughout your career and you'll learn how to do that in your newsroom and create another community so that on the hard days, uh, in between all the joy that journalism brings, you'll feel strong and empowered in your identity um, and in yourself and having compassion for yourself and for your communities. And that's why we're here today. Uh, my journey is many. Uh, I am the daughter of uh, Mexican immigrants, uh, farm workers. I was born in a teeny tiny town in Northern California, but I've lived here, gosh, I think for like 35 years. Northern California? Where? San Jose. Ah, okay, good, good. Um, okay, so you know where uh, Sacramento is, right? <laughs> okay, you know where Yuba City is? Okay, we're getting there. You know where Chico is? Go on the interstate there, like the back interstate, blink for one second and you missed my town called Gridley. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, I say that like I was born type thing <laughs> when you tell your journey, which is always dangerous, but was going to give you a good story when people are willing to start through that spot. So listen to those cues. Um, I say that because I am now a Mexican mom nerd um, who fights for equality uh, in journalism and ethics and journalism, and I taught diversity and ethics here as well. Um, <clears throat> I have that experience of being with uh, a family. My parents were teenagers when they got married and had me. We lived with my grandparents. Um, so I thought everybody had four parents. Mom, dad, ama, apa. <laughs> um, and that was really awesome. But traveling to spaces as farm workers um, in that community to go get groceries and 
knowing English and Spanish and hearing the way that people would speak to my grandmother, who to me was like this amazing miracle superwoman who somehow managed to like buy us a house and move to a whole country and work in the fields um, every day. It, to see that was an experience for me that opened my eyes to if this is how someone would, would treat my grandmother superwoman as less than, as less than human, then there are a lot of other people from a lot of other communities that can have those same experiences. And I carried that with me when I finally made it into journalism. Uh, they let me in the doors and I knocked them down. And I kept knocking them down for others and I continue to do that and I hope you do the same. Because journalism as it exists now, as we know, has an exceedingly um, tragic low trust from all sides, from progressives to um, extreme conservatives, we rate exceedingly low across the board. From communities of color to more um, white communities, white-centric communities, we rate exceedingly low with trust. And it's our job and our responsibility to build that trust back. And one way you will do that is by sharing your stories, speaking up, finding a way to feel empowered in your identity no matter what, hold that space, and ensure you lift others to hold their space here, now, today, in this journalism space and in your new spaces that you go to. Awesome. Go for it, Shamar. All right. Um, yeah, my, my journey has also been a long one. I think, um, you know, I think I'll start right before college. I was in my kitchen. I remember talking to my mom. I thought I was going to go to college to play football. And my mom said, no, you're going for academics. Um, and so I had early admission into Hampton University, and again, in HBCU, I had grown up in a diverse community in Northern Virginia, right outside DC. Um, so she drops me off on campus, and it's a total culture shock for me. Um, I had never been around uh, or in an environment uh, where it was predominantly uh, black. Um, you know, all of my friends, again, I had a diverse set of friends in high school, and so it was certainly a transition for me. And what helped me through that transition was actually journalism. Um, it was kind of where I found uh, a level of comfort um, and just telling stories on the Hampton University uh, school teams, interviewing athletes, going to different games, um, and then also um, working with the editors at the school newspaper. Um, and so I use journalism as a way just to, again, uh, help me transition into college. But then as I got deeper into it and developed a love, uh, an appreciation for journalism, I started to kind of pick my head up a little bit and look around and look at the space of journalism and saw that there weren't that many people that looked like me. And, and so uh, I would say early on, probably sophomore year, I certainly wanted to um, knock down some of the stereotypes, especially when it came to black people. Um, you know, there was at one point in this country where they thought black people couldn't read or write. And so, you know, to be, even be in the journalism space, um, as a black person, I really wanted to not only be in the space, but also to excel. I wanted to, I, I, one of my mentors who, you know, is still, I call a friend to this day, uh, he was an executive editor at the time at ESPN, um, running his own ship. Uh, they were successful and I saw him and I said, wow, I want to be exactly like him. And so really worked my butt off over the next three years in college because I wanted to be a black leader in this space because I understood that there was a need for it. And so, you know, I really wanted to be that change. I thought it would certainly be a path of, you know, working as a writer, working uh, for like maybe 10 years and then transitioning over into editing. But uh, it actually uh, worked out a lot sooner than I had expected. I had applied for an internship coming out of college out of Hampton. Um, the internship was closed at the time. They called me and asked if I would be interested in interviewing for a position, an editor position. And so right out of college, I became a multimedia editor and uh, just really have worked my way up to be a leadership, uh, excuse me, to be a leader within the newsroom, uh, to really serve as an example um, and a voice of, you know, for our community, um, to be in the room when we're making key decisions around whether it be personnel or stories and uh, how to angle a story. Um, and you know, just working with other younger journalists coming up to really be a mentor for them. Because I know how important it was for me, I know how important it was for me to see another black man in a position um, of leadership. And so it's important that 
we can't have just one. And so I wanted to add, um, you know, the lessons that I've learned to give back to um, journal, young journalists coming up and serve as an example for them. And so that's really kind of what I've hung my hat on uh, in my career and just trying to clear out space, create more opportunities when it comes to uh, black journalists, uh, very involved in NABJ. Uh, I think this year was maybe like my 12th or 13th one. Um, and it's just important because it's needed. I mean, you see, you know, as recent as this year, just how many issues come up when we aren't sensitive to minority communities because we don't have those voices in newsrooms um, that will speak up, that do have the, the skills and the, um, the, the lens to say, you know what, we shouldn't say that, you know, about this particular person or in this way. And, um, and you know, it's no fault of, you know, the people who are in those rooms and making those decisions, but, you know, to a degree, uh, it's because the makeup of the newsrooms don't necessarily represent the communities that we cover. And so, you know, when it comes to my journey, I certainly want to be a voice and a leader because more than anything, it's needed. Give it up for the, for the panelists. It, it's not easy sharing your story in front of anybody, really. But to, to, I'm, also, I'm also appreciative of you guys. Um, so, Shamar, we're gonna start with you because, because you, you struck me really hard um, when, we, uh, when we first spoke. Uh, you mentioned how you looked up at the industry and you didn't see anybody that looked like you. And so you, you mentioned it, you talked about it j just now. How important to you as a man of color is it to, to you to be that person that the young, young journalists can look up to? Uh, I would say it's no one, number two on, on my list. Um, just because I understand um, how hard it is for, for black journalists to break into this industry of journalism. And so, um, you know, the way I carry myself, you know, my work ethic, you know, I just want to be an example for young journalists so that they can hopefully emulate that within, you know, their own careers. And so um, coming up, there was only one, maybe two um, people who were in the industry and, you know, I would look at them and say, you know, I want to be like you, you know, when I graduate and when I get into a career. And so understanding how few of us there are, you know, it's of the utmost importance for me to be that example and to be a resource and to answer any questions that younger journalists have, pick up phone calls. You know, there are nights where, you know, I'm just, two weeks ago I was talking to a journalist, you know, who was having issues with, you know, his boss and, you know, he's just kind of starting off on the beat. You know, those, 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 those conversations are important to me. I had an internship in Detroit uh, after my freshman year. I interned one of the two being Rob Parker, uh, who I look up to, and it was an internship for eight weeks. I shadowed him, and at the end of that internship, he looked over to me and he said, you know, the way that you pay me back for this experience is by reaching back and lifting up the next younger journalist coming up, and that's something that's always stuck, stuck with me. That was in 2008, so uh, 14 years ago. Um, again, that's something that still resonates with me, something that I, uh, you know, try to um, do every day um, and just helping it and giving back because somebody did it for me. And so I think it's extremely important that we uh, give back, that we mentor and that we help mold the future because you all are the future. You know, journalism isn't perfect. And so it's important that we have uh, increased the diversity within this industry so that we can solve some of these issues and we're not going to be able to solve them if we don't have people in those positions that are pulling up the next generation. And so uh, very important to me. And, um, you know, like I said, I, I try to be a model each and every day. Yeah. And that's so important. You know, it's something that hits me so hard as a, as a trans person of color uh, myself, as a, I'm walking those sidelines, walking that warring track, I'm not seeing anybody that looks like me, right? There was a point, before this season where I was the only trans person in all of baseball, entire global sport of baseball. So, you know, I, I feel that I, I appreciate you for, for, for being that person. Um, Deanna, I'm going next. Uh, one of the things I think all of you in this room can tell um, that's so striking about you is your passion for, for standing up for your people, for, for, for our people. <laughs> um, how do you, how do you feel that, that, that your heritage, that, that who you are, 
um, has shaped you professionally? Um, I think the idea of standing up for our people means standing up for all our people. Um, and when you can see that, your own experiences, your own stories, your own fault lines, um, then you can understand that and have empathy for others. And that really strengthens our uh, experiences in journalism. It opens our eyes to see stories, and stories in a way that unite us. I think passion sometimes is uh, conflated, especially with marginalized communities and people of color and women of color, as the angry brown woman, which there have been time and places when I'm more than happy to be that. Um, there were moments for us to be angry, especially in these last few years, right? There was a racial reckoning for some, for reasons, um, and I say reckoning, quote unquote, because we know that that has not turned out to the equality and parity um, that our communities deserve, um, and we're still going to work on that together. I think how my experiences affect me as a journalist is that it just opens my eyes to empathize with others, and then when I share stories, I feel it's my responsibility to help someone feel and understand that that could be your mother, that could be your father, that could be your child, that could be you. And if I can share stories in that way, then I think we have a better chance of maybe perhaps not agreeing or acting in the same manner, but understanding. And that for me is a core of journalism. The idea of equity and ethics when I taught ethics and diversity here, I explained to people that parity in leadership in our newsrooms, parity in our coverage, ensuring that um, stories are shared from all centers, not a white center, which often happens because when you walk in a newsroom, there's a lack of parity in leadership. That is the reality. There's a lack of parity in staff. We have been working for more than 20 years as journalists, 50 years since the Kerner Commission for parity. And the reason for that is ethics. Diversity is not its own isolated thing. Equity is not its own isolated thing. It is the ethics of journalism to have that equality. And when you can start with conversations with professors and editors and other colleagues, that the ideas of what we're working towards and how it impacts our journalism and our stories and the decisions we make about staff and who leads a newsroom that is ethical I think it changes um, the way that you interact with people because sometimes that word identity and diversity feels outside of journalism. It is core to the ethics of journalism. Yeah, and I, I can't add anything to that. That was, yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, your story just strikes me so hard. Um, my, my, my family, migrant workers as well, um, born in... Kingsburg. I don't know if you guys know where that is. It's a great picking town in Northern California. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, it, it strikes me pretty hard. Uh, April, we'll go to you. Um, it can be really hard for anybody, but especially young people, to stand up for themselves um, when they're new in the workforce. Um, what's the best piece of advice you can give a young journalist living with a disability? Um, to stand up for themselves, to advocate for themselves um, in a world that really so often stigmatizes. Yeah. Well, I think that's an important acknowledgement, right, is that um, when you are self-advocating and speaking up for yourself, there's a vulnerability um, to that. And I, I don't think we always give that the acknowledgement that it deserves. Um, when, when somebody is talking about something so personal to them or asking for support or asking for an accommodation. Um, you know, I grew up with my disability, so sometimes people make the assumption that, oh, well, you've had to advocate for your whole life, uh, yourself for your whole life. That must be easy. You must not, you know, you must not have a problem doing with that. Um, but I was lucky. I had parents. My dad has a disability. He's wore hearing aids his whole life. So I had parents that were really deliberately focused on April can do anything and we're gonna help her su support her in doing that. But they were also very deliberate in creating opportunities for me to speak up for myself. Um, and I think that's important for our families and for parents to do that for kids with disabilities. 
But I am naturally a quiet, shy person. So that was very painful for me. I remember like being 18 and it was the first time I had to go to my neurologist since I turned 18. And my mom said, you know, I'm not going with you. This is all you. They want to hear from you. You know what to say. And I really was ticked off at her. I was mad. I was like, how dare she do this to me? Because I felt a lot of shame and embarrassment. Um, because people could visually see my disability, um, when I would come into a room, I knew that they saw that. And I was still carrying a lot of internal ableism. So ableism is like all those other isms, right? Racism, ageism, sexism. But I had kind of internalized like some of the societal views about shame and guilt. And I had to get over that and work through that. And luckily, I had a lot of role models and mentors. Um, and, and you mentioned mentorship. And I think that's so important to, ha to have those mentors. Um, they were social workers. They were also people with disabilities. And so as I entered my career, I had those people around me. But it was still a struggle. And like I had said earlier, earlier I was transitioning to being more of an invisible disability. So I was struggling with like who I was and what were the differences? Did I still need help? Did I fit working in the disability community? You know, I'd walk into a room and now people didn't see the wheelchair. So did I fit there? Did I deserve to be there? And I had people that said to me over and over again when I needed to hear it, uh, that your story is important. And that history doesn't change because your disability has changed. Your understanding of our community is still the same. You, you belong in this community. You deserve to be here to support others. And I needed to hear that for a little while. Um, I think practice is important. So you, know, you, need, you need those times where you just practice you know, asking for accommodations or saying you know, um, what your disability is. Um, on my first day at my job at Ability360, I was in a new department, so nobody knew about my disability. I fell the first day. So it's like everybody knew, right? They're like, oh, okay. But what I found was there's lots of allies out there and lots of people that will support you. Um, but I think it is important for you to feel comfortable knowing what you want to share and what you don't want to share, right? So having that kind of elevate, elevator speech, right, about who I am. And if I choose to share, um, that's great. And if I don't choose to share, that's okay. I do that selectively, but I'm empowered to do that when I need something to do my job or I need an accommodation or I need someone to understand um, the situation or what's happening with my health. Um, but I think that that's, it's important for you always to do that in a, in a space that feels comfortable um, and where you feel empowered to do that. And I, I think those allies, those people that you trust can help you um, feel supported in doing that. Um, but it, it, does, it, it does take time and, a, and a, a, a bit of, a, it's a journey to get comfortable um, or more comfortable with saying who you are and what you need and why you need it. Well, speaking of allies, this is a, a perfect uh, segue into, uh, into Casey's question. Um, if I know one thing, it's a good, it's, it's a good transition. So here we go. Um, <laughs> uh, we all know that being trans uh, right now is uh, it's pretty scary, given a, given a lot of the rhetoric and the, the political heat turned up on our, our community. Um, how, in your experience, has finding allies in the workplace really helped you along your journey? Um, it's definitely very helpful. As I mentioned, Julia Thompson was super great, and you know, she sat me down at one point and was like, hey, which do you prefer? And I have never been asked that question before. Um, so just being asked that and having to reflect and realizing, like, no, I do mostly prefer they, them pronouns. Um, and so being able to find like a group of people who are supportive of your identity is super important um, because then it's just like you can feel like you are more of yourself around them, um, whereas, you know, there's 
a sort of pause with people who you either think don't support you or you know that they don't support you, um, where you just like, okay, I'm just not gonna either bring that up or talk about that problem, um, maybe keep it a little bit more reserved in some way. Um, so just having like a group of friends around you is super important and then as well as people in the workplace, um, luckily my manager now, uh, he is super supportive. Um, his brother is trans, so we've had conversations with like, um, he started to use like the term girl with referring to people just generally instead of like using the phrase dude. And he's had a moment with me where it's, it was like, hey, I just wanted to double check that that isn't like a problem with you. Um, you know, I use that for kind of everyone um, as a, blink, a blanket term. And so um, knowing that there are people who will have those conversations with you and that you can go to, so say if like with that, with all the anti-trans bills that like I could, I could go to him and say, hey, there's this, that, and the other thing that I think needs to be either changed or edited in some way. And I know that he's back up for me. Um, and so it, it makes self-advocacy a lot easier. Um, and that's definitely something that I need to work on. Um, but it's a learning process. <laughs> Those, uh, as, as somebody who uses multiple um, pronouns as well. Those are always interesting conversations. I'm always, I always just like, I don't care, man. Use, use, <laughs> use them both in the same sentence for all I care. Like, <laughs> um, and, and you mentioned the, you know, the, the girl or dude or bro. Um, I think it's really important for, for if there's any trans people in here, it's, it's okay for those to be okay with that at one, at some point, but it's okay to change. Um, I used to be okay with being called dude and bro all the time, and you know now I don't like it anymore. And it's really important to express those views. Um, it's hard to stand up for yourself, but it's just something you got to do. Uh, so yeah, as uh, keep this moving, and we're gonna go down, go back down to Shamar here. Um, you know, allies. I think a lot of people would, in my experience, um, I'm sure Casey, in your experience as well. Um, I think you'd be surprised at just how many people want to be allies, right? Um, I grew up in, in Mesa, Arizona, um, pretty conservative part of town. I never thought I'd have any support, ever, right? Um, but then I come out of work, I, I see that there are just so many people that have never really gotten you know, the excuse to be a huge ally. Um, so putting yourself out there, advocating yourself, really. Um, it'll surprise you, uh, but Shamar, uh, you know, I, we talk about finding allies and whatever, um, but there are, there are some times where you're not, right? Um, I just hate to harp on this all the, oh, the entire time, but it just strikes me so much with you. Um, being the only person in the room, uh, how do you manage those times, being the only person of color in the room? I would say it's changed. Um, you know, as I've grown older, as I've matured, as I've learned who I am as a person, uh, one experience and that stands out to me, I won't talk about the uh, newsroom, but there was one newsroom, it was my first day. Um, I was certainly the only one. And, you know, you're the new guy. It's day one. So everybody knows, who, like, oh, this is a new guy, right? And um, remember I was uh, being introduced to everyone, but there was one guy who was sitting down and acted like I wasn't even in the room. Um, and I'll say how I handled it that day, whether right or wrong, but you know, after a while, I got up from my seat and I introduced myself to him and you know, let him know that I was a new guy. Um, again, I'm not saying whether that was right or wrong, but that's how I handled it that time. I think as I've you know, just come to learn myself a lot more, I think it's one of those things um, where I feel feel like, okay, I'm supposed to be here. And, you know, again, going back to why I got into journalism, why I wanted to, um, <laughs> why I wanted to, you know, be a leader, you know, I'm supposed to be here. And I may be the only one, but I am the one who's supposed to be here to help create, you know, the change that we need within this industry. Um, you know, for some of the younger journalists who are just, you know, getting ready to graduate or may graduate 
uh, within the next year. I think a lot of it is, you know, again, getting to a place where you are comfortable with yourself and you turn out, tune out the outside noise and really only listen to yourself. Um, and, you know, who are you? You know, you need to be able to answer that question. Um, and it's going to take time. It's not, a, you know, a question you're going to be able to answer, you know, once you graduate or even right now. Uh, it certainly takes time for you to uh, figure it out. Um, but I do think once you reach that place, uh, you know, again, the outside noise and being the only one, um, you may have insecurities in the beginning, but after, you know, a certain while, you know, you'll be comfortable with yourself and really focus on, you know, the goal and um, trying to create a space where you're not the only one anymore. Um, and so that's kind of how I have navigated, you know, uh, now that I'm older, but, you know, especially when I was a younger journalist, yeah, there were a lot of security, insecurities, imposter syndrome, uh, you know, <laughs> shy, or, you know, not willing to speak up, you know, um, but I've just had to continue working, you know, on developing my voice and being able to speak up and, um, you know, speak, you know, you sometimes you do have to be the voice of one for the voice of many. And that's not easy. That is a challenge uh, to speak up when you have people looking at you who don't look like you. Um, but through reps, through practice, uh, through just experiences, um, you know, you can certainly get there. Um, and so I would just encourage, um, you know, our younger journalists to, you know, just take some time. Um, you know, understand what your intention is of, of getting in, in this in industry um, and being patient with yourself as well um, and just realize that it's all a part of the learning experience and, and one day, you know, you'll get to a place where you're comfortable being the only one and hopefully in that place you will be in a position to uh, influence and, and bring in more um, for yourself. So, Yeah, there's so much to be said about confidence in this industry. Oh, yeah, um, definitely. It's kind of funny. I am I am probably the least confident, <laughs> shyest person you'll ever meet. But you put me out on that field at Chase Field, you know, on the sidelines at, at State Farm Stadium. I am one of the more confident people you ever meet. You're walking around like I own that place, right? Because you kind of have to. Um, this this industry will eat you alive if if you're someone like us on this industry. If if you don't have that confidence if you're not willing to stand up for yourself. And so I think, I think there's so much to be said about, about confidence. It's not something you can get overnight. I wasn't a confident person until very recently. Um, you just, you practice, you learn, um, and you, you realize that you deserve to be there. You belong there. Um, you know, everybody belongs here. Everybody in this room belongs. They, you, you deserve to be where you are right now. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, Diana, uh, going off of that, uh, what advice do you give to journalists, journalists of color entering the job straight from college, straight out of college? That's a great question. Sorry. That's a great question. <laughs> um, I think that idea of confidence is incredibly important. I wish that someone had told me that fake it till you make it was a thing. I didn't Absolutely. learn that until just a few years ago. I was like, where has that saying been my whole life? Um, and so what I tell young journalists, I have a lot of mentees um, that I have become friends with over the years. I feel very blessed for those relationships. Um, you have to think about how your best friend or your sister or your brother and how you're their biggest cheerleader, right? Like you're like, got this, you go, you, you know, you're like, you hype them up. And, and I used to joke, I should put on my resume, I'm a, like a hype woman. Um, the, uh, you have to then put on a lens that if you want that for the people that you love, you need to love yourself most and you should want the same for yourself. So whatever you want, the dreams that you want, the people you love to reach, that needs to include you. So you set those dreams, you set them high, you set them early. I tell people, I think there's a couple of people who were in the uh, internship interviews with me. I took a moment to say, I want you to think when you rank who you wanna work for, that it's not about them being lucky. Like you being lucky if they pick you, it's about you being, it's about you making a choice for where you most belong. You deserve to pick the place that you felt where they, you were treated in that interview with respect with care, 
with thoughtfulness that they built you up and didn't make you feel down when you left. I told everybody that because I want you to carry that throughout your careers. You're going to need that. This is journalists of color. Unfortunately, there are there are a few places in traditional uh, news spaces where you will be at parity. Um, you will not equitably covering the communities, reflecting the communities that you cover. And so, as Shamar said, you will be, there will be times where you'll be the voice of many, and that is very difficult, right? Because we know all black communities are not the same. We know all Latino, Latinx, Latinx communities are the same. We know not all trans communities are the same, and yet sometimes that will be the space that you have to operate in. So sprinkle some confidence dust on yourself, sprinkle it on others, walk in, and know that what you have to say about a story or coverage or fighting for an issue and telling it the way that you know is authentic matters. It doesn't mean you're always gonna win. But when you can walk away knowing that you didn't hold anything back, you're gonna feel good. And it helps you make choices along the way about where you want to be. Because your gifts and your talents and your voice are yours. You own them. You get to decide where you take them. So if you take an internship straight out of college or you take a newsroom job straight out of college, remember that that decision usually is two to four years at max. It's a stepping stone. And every time you speak up for yourself, for the stories that you believe in, for the opportunities that you believe um, you merit, for this coverage that you think um, fairly represents and reflects the communities that you're covering, all of them, um, that gives you answers to the next steps in your career. I tell people the moment I walked in the door, or the moment that they let me in the door at the Arizona Republic as an intern, I started as an intern from here, <laughs> um, I always had a really easy time speaking up for others and speaking up for communities, I had a very difficult time speaking up for myself. Um, and so that journey is something I've worked really hard to pass on to others, that I want you speaking up for yourself the moment you, no, I want you speaking up for yourself here, <laughs> this space, because this space has many of the same systemic problems that the news worlds do. I love this space. My father taught at ASU for more than 35 years. This is home in many ways. Um, but this space, because I is home, because I have been so close to it, I know that this university, as many universities, needs system change as well for equity. And so as you work here and as you collaborate and as you move, know that the more that you speak up and the more you walk out knowing that, like, I didn't win that battle, that is okay, because it wasn't about winning. It was about ensuring that I left it all on the table. You'll feel good when you go home. Got me ready to run through a wall. <laughs> Man, I got me fired up about that. <laughs> I will also say that as someone who started a job straight out of college, fake it till you make it is so important. You just have to run with it and trust that you know what you're doing. And if you don't, then you learn from it. Exactly. Yeah, I never thought I would be a photographer. I just got, I got a photography job. Um, and I just kept walking until they told me to stop and they never told me to stop. So, uh, yeah, fake it till, if you take nothing else from this, fake it till you make it. No, um, self-advocacy advocacy should be the, the lesson here. Um, on that note, April, uh, what advice do you give to students going into the workforce with, a, with an invisible disability? Know yourself. So, you know, part of knowing your disability is is understanding what helps you, what supports you, and clearly what doesn't work for you. And you don't have to explain that. It's individual to you, and that's just okay. But nobody can read your mind, and so you have to be able to, to know and be able to communicate, this helps me, this doesn't. Um, because a lot of times people will get pushed into environments or spaces, and, and knowing that that doesn't work for them um, I, I relate to a lot of what you're saying. Uh, you know, 74% of people with disabilities that are working age are still unemployed today, which is a huge problem, um, a, a systemic issue. Um, one of the programs I supervise at Ability360 is our employment network. So we work with people with disabilities on resume writing and interview skills and job search. 
And the other day I was talking to someone in that program and they'd just gone and done an interview and someone directly asked them in their interview about that disabil their disability because they saw that they had a wheelchair. And they said, April, they can't do that, right? Legally, I'm like, no, they can't. Um, they can't ask you in an interview what, what your disability is and you don't have to tell them. And so I said, well, what do you think about that? And they said, I felt uncomfortable. I said, yeah. I said, I want you to think about if that's a, if they can't follow the law in the very beginning, is that a space, is that a place you want to be at? And they stopped and they were like, no. I'm like, okay, let's, we, there's, more, there's plenty of fish in the sea, let's keep going, we'll find other interviews and opportunities. I, I think a lot of times people with disabilities, um, because they've been denied opportunities for work, um, they feel the need to take the first thing that's out there. Yeah. And they don't consider that, whether it's a good fit or even their joy or the, what their passion is. Um, I worked with somebody once, um, she was a young, uh, young adult, about 24. She had had a stroke um, when she was 18. And her family was saying, oh, you should be go, go be a cashier. And I said, is that what you wanna do? And she's like, no. <laughs> But I'm gonna do it because that, that's what they're telling me. I'm like, wait, hold on. What are you interested in? What do you care about? So oftentimes we, we take things and what, what we should do is exactly what you said. When we go into those interviews, we should really be interviewing them. Yeah. They need to prove to you that, that that's a place you wanna be. And yes, when you get into the job, there's gonna be some education and teaching that you do. But you should have an expectation in that interview that they're not breaking the law, right? That's not a too high of a bar for them to meet. Um, so I think, you know, if you do need accommodations, you know, that's when you have to say, I'm a person with a disability and this will help me do my job. Otherwise, it's up to you to disclose and whether you disclose and what you disclose. Um, I think oftentimes we've talked so much about allies and partners, you'll find people that you feel safe to do that. I have always had that and it's so valuable to me. Um, and I think you have to understand that living well with your disability and working, um, learning who you are is a journey like all of us have said. And um, you wanna always be growing and feel engaged and enjoying what you're doing. Um, but learning how to self-advocate is part of that journey. Uh, somebody recently had said to me, um, we were talking about how when you grow up with a disability, oftentimes you feel the need to prove yourself. And so, because you, you want to be included. And I certainly have always felt that way. And one of my colleagues turned to me recently and said, um, aren't you done proving yourself now? Can you stop? Is that okay for you to stop? And I was like, yeah, it is, you're right. And they kind of called me on that. It, it, as a mentor will, that's why you have mentors. And they're like, stop doing that. You're enough, you know enough, you don't have to prove it anymore. And so I think those mentors can do that for you. Um, at Ability360, we have all sorts of mentoring groups and support groups and um, when you're looking for work and uh, throughout the stages of life, because mentors are really important and that value um, is, is so important no matter where you are in your journey. But I think as you head to the workforce, really being comfortable and understanding your disability and the accommodations and, and your own story and what you need, that's gonna set you up for success. That sets you up to speak up um, and self-advocate in a way that's gonna be successful and comfortable for you. Self-advocacy, advocacy. advocacy. Uh just so important. I hope that's what, again, I hope that's what all you guys take out of this. Um, so Casey, we'll move on to you. Uh, as we all know, we don't really get a whole lot of say in some of our assignments or where we get to go or where or whatever. Um, how do you approach a potential assignment in a place that you, just, you know isn't going to be accepting? So I would say luckily, in, at least in my newsroom, um, if people don't know something and they just are undereducated on a particular topic, 
um, and they think that you are wrong in some way, you can explain it to them and they will walk away understanding a little bit more of the situation and we'll kind of just leave it at that. It doesn't really become that much of an issue. I would actually say most of my like problematic assignments more so come from like feedback from viewers. We get typo emails in. And a lot of the time, actually, it's whenever you use they or them to refer to one person. Um, and so, you know, there are certain situations in which someone's identity isn't released. And so then you would then use they or them. Um, and so we'll get emails saying like, oh, you can't, that that's improper grammar. You need to use he or, sure, like he or she. And then it's just like this whole thing. Um, there was one night that I was working and we got one of those emails in. Most of the time I would just ignore them because the people who are sending them, you kind of just know that they're not going to understand <laughs> beyond that. Um, but there was just like one night we got one in, I was sort of fed up with it. And so then I sent this email back explaining, hey, we don't have the identity of this person. Um, so we use they, them. And I even, I like referred to Miriam Webster's dictionary and I had a link in a screenshot of the, the, the definition saying, hey, you can use they or them for an individual because that is like, what else are you supposed to do? It would be inaccurate to use he or she in a situation that you don't know their identity because then you would be assuming and depending on the story that could also be problematic for whatever community that it involves um, through just making assumptions, you know, feeding into stereotypes whenever you don't know the whole story. Um, so I would say in situations like that, it's just best to like, if you anticipate someone having a problem with whatever assignment that you're working on, you don't need to like justify yourself necessarily, but be prepared to just lay down the facts and be like, you can't argue me on this because I know what I'm talking about. I, especially if it is a story on a particular community, you might be the expert in that community. Um, and so being able to show them, no, I know what I'm talking about, you don't. <laughs> like, I think that's important to just sort of be prepared for that scenario because it will happen. Um, and with that email that I sent explaining that you can use they or them for individuals, um, that sort of become our default around the, uh, the real time desk of if we get an email, we just find that email that I sent, copy and paste it and send it to them. Um, so I would say, yeah, just sort of be prepared to just flat out say, no, I'm, I'm right. I know what I'm talking about. Yeah, and that, again, the role of confidence in that, right? Um, they, them, it's always been proper grammar, always has been, always will be. Um, so confidence, standing up for yourself, it's great. Um, so that is that for my questions. Uh, we got a couple questions submitted. We got quite a few questions submitted um, from you guys. So I'll ask, while we still have time, I'll, I'll get to those. Um, and you guys can just chime in. They're not for anybody in, in particular. Uh, whoever has something to say about it, go for it. Um, this one's from Haley. Is Haley in here? Okay. Um, <laughs> how do you remain true to yourself without being concerned that you're oversharing information with your that your employer isn't required to know? Well, for me, that's always, you know, I said that elevator speech. That is literally what I am comfortable saying and what I am not. And so that helps me set boundaries about what I share um, and who I share it with. And so, yeah, I think that's really important to know what's going to feel safe for you. Um, and, and even just knowing what that is ahead of time and just being really deliberate about I, I will share this, I won't share this. This is what they deserve to know. This is not what they, they need to know legally. And this is really important. And, and you know, I've, I've had colleagues that, um, that I supervise and they're people with disabilities and I know they have a disability, they know about mine. They'll come to request a formal accommodation and so they'll start, start to pull out the medical documentation and they've written a, like two pages for me about why they need this. And I said, no, no, thank you for this, go back 
and I want you to say, for my disability, I need this accommodation, and here's what it is, and I can do my job. Two sentences. Even though you trust me with this, and I'm so glad you do, legally and as your employer, I don't have a right to anything else. Don't give me something I don't need. Keep that for yourself. And so I think, you know, just understanding those boundaries, and then with friends and colleagues, you know, just knowing sometimes you're going to get asked, you know, um, I was in a social situation once where, you know, I was with a friend who I knew very well. Somebody had come up that knew them and sat down and they had introduced me. And so they were just talking and they knew that we both worked at a disability organization. They kind of were like, oh, are you disabled too? And they used a word, not disabled, they used the word crippled. And I was like, whoa. So I said, well, yeah, I am. <laughs> and I kind of spent a minute talking and, you know, said, well, you know, we actually per prefer the term people with disabilities. And, you know, and so my friend called me later and was like, I'm so sorry. I yelled at them afterwards. And I was like, what are you thinking? We don't use that word, you know? And I was like, no, I mean, it was okay because in that moment, I was like, hey, I'll educate, I'll explain. And it, it wasn't uncomfortable for me. I knew that person wasn't trying to be rude or negative. That's the other thing, right? If, if the situation, is where one where you sense that somebody wants to be educated or can like you were talking about, then I will. But I'm certainly like you. If, if I feel like there's a wall there and I'm not gonna get through, then at some point I say, you know, I, I, I've said what I needed to advocate and to walk away feeling at peace that I've spoken for myself. The rest is on you and it's probably more about you than it is about me. Uh, yeah, um, 100%. Uh, I can sort of attest to this one. Um, as somebody who had a story on the front page of The Athletic, it's very, it's an experience working in a, in a giant building where everybody knows everything about you. Um, I've had a bunch of pretty intrusive questions, and like you said, sometimes, sometimes you just ignore it, sometimes you use it as a teaching lesson. Um, so yeah, that, that's really important. Uh, this one, let's see, which one are we gonna do? Uh, this one comes from Emily. Uh, how do you overcome the stress of fitting in at a new workplace? In a newer place? At a new workplace. A new workplace, okay. Um, I loved what you said about setting your own boundaries, um, practicing until you feel confident about that. Um, and I also think this idea of oversharing is a bit of a old trope. Um, I think one of the things I love about uh, your generation of journalists is that there's more power in your identities and you recognize it and you're showing up with it as like, I'm proud of this, like what do you mean? Like I don't need anybody to tell me to speak up for myself, I speak up for myself. I speak up for my ancestors. They fought really hard for me to be where I am. Um, and I think that's really powerful. So when I've heard some people say, oh, you were oversharing, and that person was absolutely sharing exactly what they wanted to share. And if you felt it was an overshare, that's your problem, right? So if you're in a space, whether it's a workplace or a professional space or a social space, and you get told that you're oversharing, if you feel comfortable, then maybe you can let that person know I'm sharing exactly the amount that I want. That's your problem, that you feel it's an overshare. You're not sharing because you're not comfortable, but I am so comfortable sharing everything that I've been through. I'm proud of what I've been through. Um, advice for a new workplace. I think um, setting your dreams is really, really important. I, I had that conversation. I, I, I basically like, this is my speech everywhere I go. <laughs> every interview, every mentee, every space, every panel, I say set your dreams. Set your dream job, set your dream. You walk in a newsroom, what's the job that you want there? Know it, what's my dream job? Because as long as you're working towards that goal, even if you don't get it there, every win you make is one step closer. That's amazing. But if you only set the standards for where you are today, you can't reach your dreams. You deserve to reach your dreams. You wanna be on the investigative reporting team? That's your dream? Go talk to the people, ask them, find the person, the ally, Tell, can I shadow you? Can I work with you on a story? You keep talking, keep pushing. If you get a no at first, okay, you said no two months ago. Do you have time this quarter? Find the people. If it's not in your newsroom, go to your affinity groups. 
NEHJ, AAJ, NEBJ, there is an investigative editor or reporter who absolutely will work with you. You will knock their socks off with a freelance. You will go back to your new job and show, look, because I set my dreams. I did this as a freelancer over here. I am ready for that job. I am ready for that opportunity. When I gave a panel for some students of, uh, it was a community college, mostly Latinos, mostly communities of color that were there. Um, it was about investigative reporting. It was tied to narrative investigative. Our newsroom had just won a uh, Pulitzer Prize for a border wall coverage, which Julia was part of my team on that. Um, and so one of the stories that I had written for that project was about um, an indigenous community in southern Arizona and how they would be affected. I fought for that story. It wasn't the original story list. If you don't set your dreams, you might not fight for the story that is one day going to win part of a team Pulitzer Prize. When I was on that panel with students that day, I said, everybody who's here, you all want to be investigative reporters, right? They were, yeah, they were in college still. And I said, when you walk into most new newsrooms, your new workplace, it will, there will be all of these jobs that somebody thinks are 10 years away from you, they should be your job today. You need to see yourself, you need to do. The second you walk into a newsroom, you wanna be an investigative reporter, you wanna be on the broadcast team, you wanna be on the narrative, the features team, you are that. You do those stories, you fight for those stories, you find a way because you will show yourself as you work towards that, you're sharpening your skills. So I did this joking little thing that like, if you think you're not an investigative reporter, your communities actually need you because you see the stories you grew up in them being an investigative reporter. So I'm gonna give you like a little Mexican mom blessing and you're all baptized investigative reporters. So let's put that in like la basura now and move forward. So I, my advice to you is when you work into, walk into a new news place, set a goal of the first month, figuring out what your dream job is and finding a way to work towards that because you deserve it. And that's gonna be it. We're out of time. Um, so thank you guys all so much for being here. Um, thank you to our panelists. You guys are incredible. Um, big thanks to Julia Thompson back there for putting this all together. Uh, I hope you guys got a lot out of it. Um, but most importantly, I hope you guys feel empowered to be yourselves. Uh, there's, I, I always tell my students, there's, all, there's one of me, that's plenty. Uh, the world needs a you. So be you, go out there, do your thing. Um, I think most of us are gonna be back here, gonna stay, stay back, take questions. If we didn't get to yours, we only got to two. Um, so we'll be here helping you guys out. Uh, and thank you guys so much.